Hey, what's going on folks? It's Mike here and welcome to the programming language first impression series in which we look at a programming language for the first time for about an hour or so and just understand a little bit about that language. And again, it's a language that I haven't really used in production or even seen in some cases. And today I've got an exciting programming language for you. We're going to be looking at what I believe is pronounced the hacks programming language. Now, this is a programming language that's really caught my attention because it's, well, a cross-platform toolkit in some sense that I don't know why it hasn't maybe gained more popularity or maybe it has just quietly beyond the scenes, but I want to investigate because this seems like the ultimate tool if I can write my software once and compile anywhere. Now with compilers these days like LLVM and other various frameworks as we've seen in the free Pascal world, for instance, compilers can support a lot of different platforms. So maybe there's just enough for whatever reason. Uh, but anyways, I thought this is a really interesting cross-platform toolkit and I'm curious to know how that works. So let's go ahead and look at the wiki first and then we'll go ahead and visit the website here and get things installed and learn just a little bit about it here. So let's go ahead and see here. So Hacks, a high-level cross-platform programming language and a compiler that can produce applications and source code for many different computing platforms. Uh, it's free and open source, and it's written in OCaml, which we have looked at on this series, which you can check out on the playlist below. So that's kind of interesting in itself, uh, as we mentioned in the OCaml video, uh, and we're a nice discussion in the comments section as well on YouTube, was uh, about some of the different tools. In fact, Hacks was developed in OCaml, as uh, some of our users described here, which is really neat uh, to see. Uh, again, just proving some of the use cases of OCaml. But interestingly, Hacks, I first heard about it around 2014 or so uh, from some work colleagues. Uh, but interesting to see that this has been around since 2005, this project, at least the first time that it appeared here. Um, and it still ha is having relatively active, stable releases here. So I'm filming this in January of 24. So you know, only a few months ago, there was a major stable release here. Uh, so that seems pretty cool here. Uh, now, as far as features and the standard library, it's kind of interesting to see it's supported across all platforms here. <laughs> okay, so we'll, we'll figure out what that subset is here, but I imagine if this is compiling to source code to like C or something, that pretty much gives you everything, and then it must target like JavaScript or maybe WebAssembly. Again, we'll look at the different targets and see what we can build here uh, with hacks here. Uh, but it looks like it's got a pretty rich standard library with many different uh, data types, containers. It's got reflection, math. Uh, HTTP stuff for web. Uh, let's see, what's this? OpenFL, I feel like I should know this. A framework for, uh, let's see, are these graphics? This looks like, yeah, graphics um, layer here on top of, uh, I wonder if it's, yeah, it says, looks like it's on top of, or I guess there's a few. There's hacks, then there's lime, OpenFL, uh, but something on top of maybe OpenGL or something. So it's got a lot of different frameworks. Again, I know hacks from sort of the um, game development perspective. Again, that's where I sort of heard of it because you want to be able to write an application and deploy to uh, desktop, mobile, maybe console devices as well, and perhaps other platforms here. So um, that looks like uh, how it's working here. So it's got this idea of, okay, supporting client side and server side programming in one language. Again, that's something I like. Um, I, I like if you can just write your client application in one language, and then if you write a server, that's in the same language. It's just kind of nice if you have a development team, everybody's working in the same tools. You can leverage other things like static analysis, best practices, team members can move to different stacks if they want. Um, so that is an advantage if you can get your team in the same uh, place here. And we've seen that in a lot of different programming languages. I think most programming languages you know, let you write client side or server side applications that we've looked at here. But interesting that they've uh, emphasized that in this Wikipedia page, whoever has written this. Um, but interesting to see that the code here in Hacks is written and compiled into, yeah, these various programming languages. Okay. So that must be how they're targeting things. And it's interesting to see the mix of, you know, you'd expect to see JavaScript or like a web assembly for the web. C++ or C is a target language that so could leverage those compilers, but also to see like virtual machines like Java, uh, the JVM itself, PHP, even see Python and Lua here so it could target other interpreted languages, which is kind of interesting. And I wonder if that purpose is for the interop. So if you build something in hacks, it can talk to some other framework or code base. That kind of makes it interesting. Uh, again, this is an interesting uh framework and programming language, I guess is what we're going to call it here. Uh, okay, so it does look like there's support for various uh, VS code. Maybe we'll actually use VS. I'll probably hop in Vim just to see how easy it is, but 
um because that's what we've been doing for all the programming languages um but interesting okay so there are a hacks develop tool here interesting uh no tool or is officially recommended okay but we'll have to look at let's just google this really quick here uh hacks develop here uh, okay so this is part of the hacks flixel 2d game engine and then maybe they've got an ide or something for this um okay flash develop maybe there's hacks develop or something uh distribution of okay so this is like for it is an ide but maybe it was targeted towards flash applications or something so okay interesting okay let's see here um i think the history here is kind of interesting that it was sort of supporting what looks like more web-based uh platforms like flash and javascript because there was a sort of interesting again depending on when you got into programming flash took over the internet in the early 2000s or so uh, there were some like java applications on the web but flash really took off flash games everywhere from i don't know 2005 to 10 or something uh, eventually apple sort of killed flash towards the end of that time when they said they weren't going to support it um, so i wonder if you know hacks was a well ahead of its time supporting both of these platforms to make that transition uh easy and this uh nico vm i haven't seen um uh, okay, from Shiro Games. Okay, so they've had some uh, gaming background here. Uh, and then support for PHP, and then eventually C++, and then C Sharp. Okay, so interesting here. Okay. Uh, and it was developed by Nicholas uh, Kinez here. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correct here. Um, and this is the name here. Short and simple. Has an X inside. Okay. Which the author asserts humorously is needed to make any new technology a success. <laughs> okay. Um, so maybe Nicholas uh, or Nicholas can uh, tell us the actual pronunciation of this, but that's that's kind of funny. Uh, I like that. Okay, so anyways, um, this is uncharted territory because I wasn't really involved in Flash or ActionScript or this sort of development too much. Um, I leaned into basic and then like C++ programming later on uh, during this time, but interesting to see that's a successor of ActionScript two here okay so not something i was expecting to investigate in this series but you never know what's going to come up here <laughs> so we're looking at programming languages and their origins here um okay so let's see so yeah basically it compiles itself into a bytecode and then i guess there's a bunch of virtual machine targets and then it can also compile to source code interesting so this is going to be really interesting as far as looking at the language to see what it supports as far as maybe a common subset of um, language features that maybe are easy to translate. I wonder if that sort of drives some of the development um, as well as just seeing some of the tooling that targets these different languages. Um, so it says there's even an interpreter here. And that's kind of interesting. You know, again, we're kind of drifting away from the you know, focusing on the programming language side. Again, it's when I call this a programming language series, we're looking at the whole ecosystem. Um, but this is kind of interesting and something that I do like with programming languages, if they have like a interpreter so it can rapidly iterate, right? Even if I'm not getting as fast a performance, it lets me test ideas uh, very quickly without having to wait to do a build. So again, if you have a really large project, this could be really useful. So just having that interpreter available to get some performance, I think is really interesting here. Um, okay, and then you could do some interesting, let's see, compile time stuff uh, and modifications. Okay, very interesting here. And then yes, okay, so this language inspired by the right ones, uh, run anywhere, that's sort of the um, Java paradigm, right? So with the JVM, I think Free Pascal sort of subscribes to this as well. Um, so that's kind of interesting here um okay and then it is an optimizing compiler it's got some of the standard features you'd expect and then let's get a brief idea of some of the targets here um yeah this is like targeting everything uh now let's see what's the difference between a tier three and tier one here uh does it describe what that is um i don't know what that is maybe that's important um interesting interesting Okay, but it's also describing how it targets some of these, or rather it does a direct translation here. Okay, and we've had a lot of these things. Looks like the interpreter is the newest thing, uh, but otherwise we've had a lot of these features here. Uh, interesting to see the different uh, targets here on some of these things. Um, okay, interesting here, interesting. Uh, C++ seems to have the most here, other than 
I guess like JVM would have tons of stuff. Um, okay, interesting. So briefly, the advantages, again, targeting multiple platforms, uh, strictly typed code. Okay, so that's usually statically typed languages or something that we like. So uh, strictly typed, again, is some sort of very strongly typed language. Um, okay. Uh, let's see. We'll, we'll get into some of these things when we actually look at the language. I want to actually get this uh, installed, but it looks like it's got features. Again, they're talking about the type system, uh, various types of polymorphism. So there must be inheritance as I was scrolling down there with the interfaces. You've got modules and packages. Okay, so I tend to like that. Um, uh, at least having module-based systems, classes with interfaces. Um, this seems reasonable. You've got generics here. Uh, I wish more languages would copy off D. I think D has it right with the parentheses. I think it's the cleanest um, generic programming that I've seen. But again, you know, I'm a little bit biased uh, as I do a lot of uh, D programming. Uh, and that's what I sort of think of. Uh, but yeah, this is interesting. Okay, identity function here. Sure. It's got enums. I wonder if these are strongly typed like enum classes in C++ or other languages have these more typed. Um, uh, interesting to see here. What is this here? RGB. Is this like a type here? We'll have to figure out what that is here. Um, if that's providing some sort of definition or something, that's kind of interesting. Um, uh, yeah, interesting. Uh, okay, we got classes, static functions, uh, the trailing return type, switch statements. Um, oh, interesting, I guess. So a color, I guess, you could specify as red, green, or blue or just as something with, you know, all three of these properties here. That's kind of interesting uh, and something that we haven't really seen, right? Enums we usually think of in programming languages as just one uh, value. Um, so in C, for instance, these would just be integers and in other programming languages that sort of extended the power of enum so it can be uh, effectively any type uh, or at least any primitive type. It could be a char, maybe a string if that's a primitive type in the language, uh, maybe any type, again, depending on the strength. Uh, but this is an actual aggregate of uh some types here so some almost like struct here right some some piece of data so that's kind of a nice example and, and what this is doing because you might actually sometimes represent a color just with a integer and then just shift the bits here so you know this is effectively showing how to populate each of those values here so yeah that's kind of interesting uh interesting use case and again if you're coming from games maybe you learn this technique of packing um you know, three values into a integer. That's, um, you know, not uncommon to, to see. Okay, let's see what else we got here. Um, well, interesting, valid calls here. Okay, var red int equals, we'll have to see what this is here. Um, let's see, this is sort of uh, a switch expression can apply pattern matching to an enum value. Okay, so this does have like some, some pattern matching. Um, I see, yeah, yeah, where we're returning some um value based on the color okay reasonable enough here okay it's got optional uh types here uh which are something that have become more popular integrated into some languages right uh, and this is a way to kind of handle error handling right where you return some value or none to indicate that you don't have something uh kind of interesting to see either um left like an either or value type here that's kind of interesting um so again, these are primitives you can build pretty easily in a language, but uh, if it's an enum, I wonder if that, again, you know, when you use that with a switch or something and pattern matching, that's going to enforce that you're handling both cases. So again, probably uh, the right thing to do from a programming language uh, standpoint here. Okay, so we're going to just maybe we'll run through these features and then we'll get to the install here. Uh, anonymous types here. Okay, let's see here. I can define some different types here. We've got functions. Um, Let's see, uh, with different ways to talk about the signatures. Functions are first class values in hacks. Okay, so that means that we're able to do things like, you know, pass functions inside of other functions, uh, but it's not as strict as, let's see, Haskell or ML. Let's see, yeah, where you have like functions with one argument. Um, uh, and in hacks, functions can't be partially applied per default. Okay, so maybe there's a way to do it here. Uh, that's fine. Uh, anonymous functions. Okay, so I can assign those to values or just have uh, lambdas here. Okay, uh, or anonymous functions. Uh, you could call either or. Uh, let's see here. Abstract types. Okay, so you can have abstract classes. Structural typing. Let's see. Um, 
Let's see. Hacks and plays it in presence of anonymous types. Okay, let's see what's going on here. Anonymous types and hacks are analogous to the implicit interfaces of the language Go. Okay, we looked at Go as the very first language on this series. Not sure if we actually got to much of this typing stuff here. Um, in contrast with Go interfaces, it's possible to construct a value using an anonymous type here. Okay, let's see. I guess they're just, I assume what they're referring to, I wish they'd put a little comment by uh, this, just constructing the type. Um, let's see here, structural typing, huh? So I'm assuming, let's hover over this, uh, major class of type systems which we're able to figure out basically what the type is based off the definition. I mean, I, I guess that's all that's saying is, yeah, if the compiler is smart enough to figure out that if I've got this thing that's a uh, foo in a bar, it must be uh, this structure that you're passing in, right? Whether you're doing it explicitly here or it's able to figure it out here. Um, yeah, that seems seems reasonable. Um, <clears throat> Okay, uh, let's see here. Okay, and then this is just about the compiler. Uh, and then other languages maybe we'll look at, maybe take a look at that list and see if you want to see any of these. Uh, I will note, just as a spoiler alert, you are going to see at least one of the languages here that hasn't been covered, so stay tuned for that. But let's get to the official website and see how the authors uh, or of the Hacks Foundation sell this here. So let's go ahead and start the download here. Uh, let's go ahead and see Linux 64-bit binaries. Um, okay, so that's just going to start downloading in my downloads folder. So let's just go ahead and open that up here. And let's see here. Let's see, we've got hacks here. We've got the lib changes. Let's just go ahead and open this up in a terminal and we'll see if we can get this. Uh, let's just see if I just run dot slash hacks. Is it that simple? Uh, uh oh, we're getting this error here. I think I've just messed up my operating system or something here <laughs> with this. Um, so I'm going to cheat here a little bit. Let's see if this fix. I'm just going to install this from my package manager. So maybe it'll be a little bit older version um, of hacks here because I, I blame myself here. Maybe my Ubuntu is too old or something. Um, and that'll be a weekend project to upgrade. Uh, let's see if that fix things here. Okay. That at least gives us hacks. Let's see what version it installed. Okay. 3.44. Okay. So we're going to be a little bit older. Hopefully that's not going to cause a problem. We're just looking at the basics here, but, um, uh, that should do the trick here, but, um, interestingly, okay. So pretty painless installation process from a package manager or the install. Um, if you haven't corrupted your operating system, like I have apparently with my glib. Um, <laughs> so, um, what's interesting here, I mean, immediately I see the options. So we're going to have a little bit of fun here with just targeting our source code and see what this looks like. Um, and generate different, uh, targets here. This is kind of cool, uh, for us to see here. I, I wonder what this means for debugging this tool here. I mean, okay. I can add debug information to the compiled code, but, uh, well, we'll see with a uh, hack. So anyways, pretty painless to install. Let's get back to the homepage and, uh, we'll get an introduction here. So we learned a little bit about this already, and obviously we can target many different platforms. Um, it seems games is an emphasis, as I recall, web, mobile, uh, well, really anything here. So that's kind of cool here. Let's see some of the use cases here. Um, again, I'm excited about games. That's what we kind of look at on this channel. Um, I mean, these are real commercial games. I've, I see these on the Steam store. This is kind of cool here. I mean, uh, and the best thing you want to do is show off like some cool stuff. Oh, wow. Evo Lamb. That's pretty cool. Um, this I did not know. Playable. I did not know that the Hacks creator made Evo Land here. Hold on now. Uh, we have to play this trailer here because I thought this was one of the most innovative games here um, that I could recall. I mean, I just I saw this on I, I played the first one. And the cool thing about this game. So sorry to go off on a tangent is. You start off 2D, it takes you through different wormholes, and the graphics sort of progressively get better, taking you through a history of uh, gaming. So, um, hmm, I know what I'm going to be doing this weekend <laughs> after this recording here. Uh, so anyways, I thought that's cool. Uh, did not know that's the uh, Hacks creator who made this. So anyways, um, cool to see some of the um, emphasis here, and I guess it's used with some different game engines uh, as well here. Or, or these folks built a game engine um incorporating blender and maybe hacks here let's see some of the other domains because i know not everybody can, cares about games uh or game development web apps um let's see here so they got some uh video stuff 
um, UI libraries, doing stuff with WebGL, uh, full stack development. Uh, okay, so there's stuff for Electron, integrations with jQuery, server side stuff. Okay, so this is all pretty cool here. Uh, let's even see the mobile here. What do they got here? Popular libraries. Okay, so this OpenFL that they're talking about um, for developing applications. So this is all really pragmatic stuff here for just getting work done. Uh, okay, so you target C++ to get the native speed and then use one of these frameworks. Um, okay, interesting. Uh, let's see what else here. What do they got on command line or desktop apps? Uh, maybe stuff, some stuff listed here. Check style, static analysis tools. Um, maybe we'll want to actually take a look at that here. I always want good tooling around the programming language that I'm using. Uh, it looks like this is a pretty active project as well. Um, yeah, I want to run a linter uh, or these types of things here, so I don't have to think too much, and I can just get the best style and updates. Um, okay, structured database for game projects, UI stuff, React Native, and so on. Okay, I mean, there's a full suite of applications here. So it seems like it's pretty well proven, um, again, as far as companies using this, right? I see big names here uh, in, in pretty active projects, which is pretty cool here. Um, so shout out to the creator of uh, Hacks for both Evoland and creating a uh, very pragmatic tool here. So I'm excited to actually dive into the language here um, as we get into it. Um, and some of these series, I also like to look at the standard library and just see what that ecosystem looks like. And this looks pretty rich here. Um, now, it is interesting to see that there's sort of cross-platform stuff that I suppose is maybe built in the core like Hacks library. Um, and then maybe there's some stuff that's specific to different platforms. And some of this makes sense, right? If I'm targeting Android, right? You've naturally got sensors or whatever that only work on various devices versus maybe iOS or whatever for different versions of the phone. Um, so that all that all makes sense. That's not something I'm too worried about. When you look at, you know, the emphasis of this project is still on cross-platform stuff. And then you've got various uh, specializations. But, you know, if we look at the C++ stuff, um, yeah, there's different stuff for doing uh recording compression telemetry okay so there's enough interesting stuff here um okay here were the like super popular libraries lime which was one of the graphics frameworks i believe uh, or like a gaming framework um okay but was maybe high level flixel 2d game engine okay so again we got some some cool stuff there um, okay, let's go ahead and uh, check out what else we've got. Okay, so we've got the Learn Hacks, the introduction here. That's probably where we'll start. And as always, when I look at programming languages, I like to look to see that there's like, um, oh, this is kind of cool, community-driven cookbook here. Uh, that's quite nice. Um, I, I want to look and see that it's active. You know, it's got good beginner resources. I mean, if we look at the blog here, um, you know, there's some relatively recent stuff here uh on the proposals here of the language yeah i mean there, it still looks like there's active development uh going on here community is active um cooking up the first hacks in what is this uh to me pasta okay interesting hack summit here okay <laughs> uh interesting so it looks like there's um i'm just kind of looking for this because uh, again, okay, yeah. So this is like an looks like there were some online events and so on, uh, which is cool. Okay, so there is like an events contact here. Uh, again, the purpose of me just kind of showing this is I like to see active languages, foundations, frameworks, and so on uh, when looking at a language. So that's kind of cool. If there's a community, there's actual job postings, uh, which is kind of neat. Uh, so yeah, cool. Uh, I mean, this is just a very pragmatic uh, project, and yeah, of course, Nicholas is. Uh, uh, still doing stuff here. This might be an interesting tab for folks to look at uh, for building games here. Uh, okay, so it looks like, I mean, Nicholas has uh, been responsible for uh, building some of these himself or maybe his teams uh, with him. Some really cool games here. Uh, so cool to see an overview of the different tech stack here. Yeah, and the language is hacks here. I mean, uh, that's, uh, and then here are some of the other toolkits um that folks might be interested in so kind of interesting to see um it looks like there's a whole like maybe game framework or game engine around this too um so very cool um you know i'll leave that open just if you want to google that tab as well uh let's see what else here okay we got a taste of this and we could preview this online 
Uh, let's see here. We got a little game application here. So we create a class. We can have an instance of our game with the main function. Uh, and let's see here. What are we doing here? Tracing some result. Okay, so this is rock, paper, scissors, I guess. <laughs> uh, so we're doing a switch on the player's A move and the player B move. Okay, so they get to choose one of these things. Um, so if it's rock over scissors, paper over rock, scissors over paper. Uh, interesting here. And otherwise, there's a draw. Okay, so hey, that's a pretty uh, elegant way to um, implement the rules here versus having a bunch of if statements. So pattern matching, again, one of these... Uh, Features, I would say that modern programming, every modern programming language I see feels like they're like, hey, we got to get pattern matching in. And it is a way to provide some eloquent uh, solutions, um, right? As we're looking through the features here, pattern matching is on that list, right? And we're seeing more enums because that tends to lend toward compile time stuff here. Uh, string interpolation, another feature that just makes it sort of easy to structure your code so you're not constantly it just makes string processing and parsing and these types of things easier. Um, let's see if we click on these, let's see an exact, uh, right. This is what we mean by string interpolation. Just put a dollar sign. Like maybe if you've done some, some bash programming, you've seen this, uh, right. Where you just kind of, um, if you want to evaluate something, yeah, you put the curly braces. So, I mean, this is something a lot of languages are starting to see here, right? So you could just put in your variables that are in the local scope, or whatever scope is uh, available uh, and view them here. Okay, so that's kind of nice here. Uh, let's see what else we got here. Uh, static analysis. Let's see, is that built in here? Since hacks 3.3, uh, which uh, here, let me close this out. We have hacks 3.44. Okay, so we could try this out here. We could do dash D analyze optimize. Okay, cool. Let's see if that flags here somewhere. Uh, okay. I could show extended help information here. Uh, let's see here. Okay. Or we could just, you know, know about these things here. Okay. So here's ev like everything. <laughs> yeah. We want everything. Uh, let's see. And what did that, uh, if I grab for analyze, did that show up? Uh, maybe not. Here, let's Oh, 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 what's it doing? Oh, all my stuff. Uh, okay, maybe it's not uh, piping that out properly. <laughs> anyways, uh, okay, anyways, we got our, our help here. Display, oh, display code tips. Interesting, okay. Uh, I guess this is part of like the static analysis, maybe. That's kind of cool. That's the first time I've seen that. And we're just going to stumble upon some of these features. And then here's the eval uh, for just evaluating the code here. Okay, cool. Anyways, uh, let's go ahead and keep looking through here. Um, okay, so a lot of these other things we did see in the uh, Wikipedia page here. Uh, so anyways, getting a feel for the language here. Uh, okay, oh, here and here's some of the uh, more recent news here uh, as of just a few weeks ago. Hacks Roundup 699 here, let's see. Um, and they've got regular meetings here. Okay, cool. So, I mean, they've got a pretty... Um, Again, active uh, setup here. Um, Discord server. Okay, cool. People and projects. Yeah, I mean, uh, they, they've kind of figured out their, their structure here. So you can follow along, contribute to the project, and so on. And latest videos. That's something I've not seen as much. But, you know, programming languages need to, uh, you know, lean into YouTube a little bit here. Uh, okay. And hacks up 2023. Great. Great that we found this here. Um, because this looks like the active, uh, conference here. Uh, we saw the hacks in, oh my goodness. There's a, a ton of these here. Okay. So ton of these, uh, with the videos and conferences. So again, very active, uh, community here. I like that. Okay, great. Um, and if folks know in the comments of other meetups and stuff, uh, you know, please, please let us know about that here. So, okay, I think we've got a pretty good idea of the community, some of the infrastructure. Uh, it's time to look at the language here. So let's go ahead here. Um, and again, from the page here, just going to the introduction page. Let's go ahead and take a look at the hex language. Uh, and let's just start from here. Let's see, it's gonna give us an introduction here, uh, which we know about. Let's, let's write our hello world here uh, and see what happens here. 
Uh, I think this is going to be a pretty important Hello World <laughs> in comparison to, say, other Hello Worlds that we've written because we're able to target so many different um, uh, targets here. So for the web and so on here. Okay, and we'll have hacks 344. Sorry, this is a little bit older version, but just wanted to get us started with something. Uh, so anyways, let's go ahead and do a uh, hello. Uh, I don't even know what to call this file here. Does it need an extension? <laughs> let's see here. Because um, that looks like the output that we're going to do. Let's try just hello, no extension here. We'll write a class, hello world. So it looks like this is sort of an object-oriented uh, language here, which isn't a bad way to approach things when you're targeting tons of other uh, languages. Let's do the trace. Hello, world. Okay, uh, let's go ahead and compile this. Let's see what happens here. X, our main file. Okay, I'm going to specify that with hello, and we'll compile it to JavaScript. Hello, world.js. Uh, let's see what happened. <laughs> Did I get an error? Let's see here. Uh, well, I ran it here. Error unknown option dash dash main. Oh, maybe it's just dash main. Okay. Sorry, this is an older version of hacks. Uh, so error class name. Let's start with an uppercase letter. Um, oh, is that for this hello? Or is this the hello world that we are compiling here? Okay, so we got to figure this out here. Um, so this is enforcing that our module name must be the same. Let's see here. Let's move uh, hello to hello world. And okay, so now let's try this. Hello world. Uh-oh, what other errors did we make? Um, Let's see here. Error unknown option dash dash js. Okay, it's just one dash here. Ooh, no problem there. Type not found. Hello world. Interesting, interesting. Okay, so um, it largely follows the ECMAScript standard. Uh, okay, so I wonder if I should have named this thing uh, something else here. Let's see. Oh, I see. I should have read the directions just a little bit further. Uh, hello world hx okay so that's what it's taking this file as here okay and it's fair for the compiler to assume or read in uh you know files of its extension so my fault there okay now let's give this a try here okay great that gives us a js version um okay so let's see here uh let's skip ahead let's just run it here uh sorry let's make this a little bit bigger here for you uh, through the interpreter, hacks, main, uh, hello, world, and just interpret. Okay, so one, or I think maybe just one dash here in my version, maybe two, let's see. And it runs, hello, world, cool. Uh, and it tells you what line and everything. Okay, because uh, trace, okay, so that's that's something I've seen in other programming languages, it's just logging what's going on here. Uh, cool, so we've run our first program here. We've also got the JavaScript, you know, source that was generated here. Uh, so cool. It's using the strict version. It's written our program here. Uh, now, if I run this through, like, let's see, do I have Node.js here? Can I just do hello world? Uh, maybe I just have Node here. Okay, we're going to, there we go. Okay. Um, cool. Uh, so now it's running the JavaScript version. Okay. Um, why is this programming language not more popular? <laughs> That's going to be one of my first questions here. If I'm able to just target everything, you know, problem solved here. Hello world uh, jar here. Uh, oops. Uh, again, probably just one dash with the main here. And probably just one dash with the JVM. Okay, maybe I made another mistake here. Maybe I don't have my JVM set up properly. Uh, dash JVM. Okay, so that option's unknown. Again, apologies, I'm using an older version uh, today. Okay, so maybe we can't do that. Let's try with just the dash CPP because I want to see what kind of uh, code this generates here. Hello world, CPP. Uh, okay, this is the first time you're running hackslib. Pre 
please run hackslib setup. Okay, hackslib setup. Uh, I'm assuming that's going to. Uh, okay, that's fine. You don't have access rights. Okay, so sudo hackslib. Type in my super secret password. Okay, so it is there. Now let's try to compile this to C++. Air highlight uh, library hxcpp not installed. Hxcpp. Uh, get install hxcpp. Wonder if that is found. Okay, so we got to do some other stuff here. That's fine if we just run the interpreter or JavaScript uh, for now. Um, but I am sort of curious. I mean, if I'm just able to just do like C sharp. Uh, okay, I got to. Okay, so I gotta install the different hackslib. Oh, run hackslib install. Okay, hackslib install. Let's do hxcpp. Brilliant. Okay. Um, failed to write. Probably need sudo access. There we go. Uh oh, now it is installing a new version uh, four or something, which is different. <laughs> but let's see if it'll still work here. Uh, here. Okay, it's doing a comp compile here. Okay, and it's setting up maybe some of the other different libraries that we need. That's fine. And it's linking, and it built a hello world CPP. Let's see what happened here. Uh, oh, okay, it gave us a whole whole project here. Did I open a directory? Uh, hello world.cpp. I did. Okay, so I got a project I can run. <laughs> Let's see. Now, it looks like I have a build... So Again, I guess I'm just always going to do this from hacks uh, here when I'm doing this. But let's look at the generated source code. Okay, so it's got the libraries and so on. Okay, so it's doing quite a bit of work here to set this up, which I'm fine with. Again, because I'm I'm only writing it here, but I'm assuming it's got a link in like the runtime and which gives me features to maybe some of the standard library features and so on. Uh, it's creating the class, right? I'm probably never, if I'm in hacks, like modifying this code, right? There's probably somewhere that it says never do that, right? Because again, you're just working in the hacks source file. I'm assuming it's going to say that somewhere in the documentation uh, to warn me. Um, but yeah, that's kind of cool. And it's kind of a nice message to folks to say, like, I mean, when you see what's being done with this tool, um, it's kind of like, again, as I keep saying, you can do this, uh, if you want, right? There, there's nothing stopping you from translating your source to another language and compiling it if you want to support more platforms. Um, or in uh, Hex's case, compiling to some intermediate representation. All right. All right. Uh, so we made it through our hello world here. Um, let's see here. And I'm already fascinated with this here. So uh, let's go ahead and see if we can find sort of the next steps. Uh, the language features here. Okay. So we're just going to kind of walk along here. Um, let's see here. Okay, so we've got conditional compilation. So there is a preprocessor, um, which some folks like or maybe don't like here. Uh, array comprehensions. Let's let's try some of these out here. Uh, let's see. So I'm gonna just gonna do everything probably in this main function here. This reminds me of like Java. <laughs> but let's see here. Uh, create a new variable, even numbers. Okay, so I'm gonna generate my array here. Uh, which I'm assuming var is going to infer the type for me. 4i in 0 to... Uh, oh, three dots, not like Pascal. If i modulo 2 equals 0, that's an even number. Uh, give us i. Okay, and I wonder if I could just do trace and then provide like even numbers or something like that. Uh, let's run these through the hacks interpreter. Um, let's see here, where was it? Uh, here it is. Let's see if that works. Now, type not found. Hello world. What have I done? Did I break something here? This this should be working. Right? How do I do comments? Let's see. Type not found. Still hello world. Oh right. right. Okay. Axe test. There we are. Okay. So ha hello world. Okay. So comments are. Uh, backslashes <laughs> by trial and error. Are they going to be backslashes or whatever? Um, cool. Yeah, just can print this out here. We see our array comprehension. Uh, that's also something I don't think we've seen or at least maybe gotten to that point in our uh, first impressions. But interesting to see that that's one of the first things that they put in here. Uh, you know, initialize and populate data uh, and arrays very quickly. I mean, this saves you from having a function call or returning something. Uh, now, I wonder how good this programming language is 
or or if it's going to build over time to doing stuff at compile time right can i generate code that computes this at uh like const expert or something like in the c c++ version that's kind of an interesting question and maybe our optimizing compilers will get better at this certain languages will just you know try to compile anything that they can um at compile time because because it would be interesting to just populate this as like a static variable or something or maybe there's a way to make this static so that it does attempt to for languages that do support some feature do that kind of work at compile time so anyways that's kind of interesting here um okay anyways here we got our anonymous structures here let's just go ahead and create some of these here get a feel for the language uh very clean um i mean that's that's as clean as it gets here semicolon language uh we'll also note here let's trace our point i mean it already i could you know if you're um oh and a nice uh printout here that's very clear if you're familiar or comfortable with a c based language especially like c sharp or java i mean or javascript as this is meant to uh, supposedly be you know similar to you can start programming in this today uh, and get the benefits so that's kind of cool uh, okay, so we got our nooms here uh, for different uh, cases here. You can have different types in them. Um, okay, let's see our iterators here. So we got our range-based for loops. Uh, nothing too crazy there. Uh, again, let's go ahead and do just again getting a feel for the language for i in one, two, three, four, and we can trace out i. Okay, so pretty pretty clean there. We have local functions here. Um, Okay, um, so I'm trying to see what this example is trying to show us. So I have a global variable. I can just call append uh, function on it here, which accesses this. Okay, local functions and closures. Not sure what this example is exactly lining up to, um, but okay, interesting. I think this is just saying that I can have free functions um, and basically pass you know functions into other functions or maybe other uh that get the context if that i mean that's what a closure is so interesting okay uh let's see i can add metadata to fields uh interesting here okay uh so let's see here classes or expressions can communicate information to the compiler or the macro system interesting uh, this seems familiar um even these examples <laughs> for some reason uh, but it's kind of interesting here uh let's see here uh, what else do we got here? Uh, we could try some of these out here. I mean, let's I, uh, let's try out some of these here. I'm trying to think. Um, I mean, this is kind of interesting here. Let's let's put this in our hello world class here, uh, just as a field here. Um, and I've associated some metadata here at range uh, here one to eight. Uh, interesting here, uh, and let's get okay cool uh let's try this out here uh and then i'll i'll make the example a little bit bigger here uh here we go so uh okay uh and this is get fields of hello world cool um okay so this is kind of interesting here, uh, showing off runtime type information. A lot of languages have various ways to do this, right? And you can turn this on or off depending on if you need this sort of capability. And I think you open yourself up to interesting ideas about um, you know, if you want to do reflection or these types of different things here. Uh, but I could get the fields from this class here and specifically the ones that look like they're tagged range here. Um, and it's providing this metadata here, uh, which was printed out here, one to eight. Um, so that's kind of interesting here. Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting to have runtime type information. I mean, this is the kind of stuff that, again, since this looks like it's targeted towards more multimedia applications and games, you tend to want to be able to have some uh, metadata here. Uh, so that's just sort of makes sense here. Uh, so kind of, yeah, interesting to see that. Um, Seeing this in D, I think this is probably in other languages too, where, yeah, you just use the at symbol and define your own uh, user-defined attribute or metadata. Again, different programming languages are going to call it, um, you know, slightly different things, whether it's attributes or metadata or whatever. Um, at the end of the day, to the compiler, it's metadata because it's maybe not um, 
code that's running, but it is communicating information that maybe informs how code is generated or other things here. Uh, let's see here. Static extensions. Existing classes and other types can be augmented with additional functionality through the using static extensions. Okay, interesting here. Uh, okay, so using string tools. Um, okay, so what does this mean here exactly? Does this mean I'm adding to strings this ability to trim and HTML escape? It'd be interesting. Let's, let's dive into this because I don't uh, exactly understand here. Uh, okay, so this is adding, okay, some extender class here. Um, and let's see here. Okay, I'm going to call this triple function here on 12. Okay, I see, I see, I see. Okay, so, so an extender here is taking some function, the type that it can operate on. Okay, I mean, these are just basically function calls here. Um, but by providing this class here, um... I guess it's sort of like in, I'm trying to make the analogy again in C++, if you have things that just take one argument, right? These like explicit uh, functions that can, I guess, just be transformed or operated on um, a piece of data. So this integer, I could call a triple. And I like here the universal function call syntax, something I haven't talked about, but I can just do some value dot something versus providing triple with an argument inside i'm assuming i could do both here uh, but but that is a nice thing of this uh hacks language it's something that when i don't see it in other languages i miss it for sure uh being able to do just chain together the function calls here uh, even if it's on a value uh, which 12 i wonder if it's treating this as a primitive type or if that is a actual object uh you know the integers here okay so kind of interesting uh being able to just extend the functionality or maybe even um let's see i mean this is kind of interesting let's see static ex extensions are usually considered syntactic sugar and indeed they are but it's worth noting that they can have a dramatic effect on code readability i see i see yeah, yeah so so by adding these classes with these uh functionality this is what it's giving you the the chain calls here i guess interesting okay so Okay, interesting. So it's like doing an import, but um, and if you define it as such by taking in whatever the type is, then you could do the universal function call syntax. Um, I mean, this this stuff makes sense. Uh, okay, uh, string interpolation we already took a look at, uh, but we haven't. Uh, I mean, there's not too much to do with this. <laughs> uh, let's see, partial function application. Okay, so you have like uh, I'm able to basically just partially evaluate uh some function here set to 12 let's see uh is basically i'm leaving in placeholders here which i'm assuming uh th this is cool we should we should set this up here let's see if i just write some function here uh let's call it add let's see let's write our first function here uh and we'll take in let's see let's get our syntax right for taking in arguments what is it like value colon int or something like that? Uh, okay, let's see if that much compiles. Let's compile. Okay, it does. Uh, let's take in two now. now. Can I do a comma b? Let's see. Do I get that shortcut? Okay. Looks like I do. No errors. Nothing screaming at me. Uh, and then let's return a plus b. Is it that simple? I don't have the trailing return type. It's not complaining to me but maybe it's smart enough to infer that uh let's see here Int something like that okay it's happy enough maybe because i'm not doing anything with it it did the dead code elimination um, so let's go ahead and trace this uh let's see trace add seven and two can i uh, access add in static function uh, let's see, characters 14 to 17 for function are argument V. Okay, what's that mean? Uh, maybe this has to be a static function as well. Which is fine. Okay, cool. That is fine. Okay, so I can add. I did my add here of 7 and 2. Um, so now let's do the partial function evaluation. Uh, let's see, where did I lose that? Here we are. Uh, interesting. Okay. Uh, var map equals new hacks dot ds int map here. Okay. 
Um, okay. And I'm assuming this int map is some sort of data structure. I'm just setting indexes or indices to some value. So let's, let's dive a little bit more into this here. Uh, function bindings here. Okay. Yeah. This is an int map of like strings, slightly different from what we saw here. I just want to do a function that does like a, uh, add with a placeholder or something. Let's see if I can do that here. Uh, basically I just want to do like var, uh, always add to, and then set that equal to, um, like add with a placeholder and then two, basically something like that here. Let's see. Okay. So that's going to give us unknown identifiers here. Uh, let's see here. Do I have to do this map thing here? Interesting. And then let's see. Function bindings. Okay, so hacks three. Phew, we're in the right version. <laughs> Allows binding functions with partially applied arguments. Okay, each function type can be considered to have a bind field, which can be called with the desired number of arguments in order to create a new function. This is demonstrated here. Okay, so we'll try to follow this here uh, with our little example of our map equals new hacks ds int map. Uh, these are going to be of ints though for me. Uh, so let's see if we could get that far. And then var. Uh, this is my always add to function, uh, which is going to be equal to my map setting and binding. Uh, let's see here. Uh, let's see if this is working here. Like this is, I think, what I want here. Let's see. Okay, so that much works. Cool. And then let's go ahead and do a trace with our always add to, but now I can just call it with one argument. So I should get a three here at line 13. Uh, the trace function makes that convenient for me to see that. Uh, void should be dynamic. Okay, for a function argument. So something at line 13 here. Um, oh, interesting here. Okay. So um, let's see, type here. Now, what is this doing here? Um, this is returning the type for me or something. Um, oh, this is kind of interesting. Yeah, this is something I haven't really done too much in other programming languages, but certainly is more, I mean, it's, it's very handy to be able to write a function that, right. You can just have a placeholder for, um, I mean, and maybe this is a common operation. So I can basically create an alias for this function here. Um, now let's see if I just, let's get rid of the trace here. Let's try to get rid of some things here. Okay. So maybe that did the right thing here and I might have to call like results. Let's see if that works. I uh, cannot use void as a value. Okay. Um, so what is this map dot set here? int to string to void and then well i don't i don't know what that's doing <laughs> let's see here uh type map dot set okay what is that telling me warning key int value int void well let's read a little bit further along uh line four let's see one two three four uh, binds the function to a variable f and applies 12 as a second argument the underscores to denote the argument is not bound, uh, which is shown by comparing the values in map set and f. The bound string argument is effectively cut from the type, turning a int string void into int void. Okay. Uh, so that's basically just saying, yeah, we've simplified the function, right? It's just taking a, uh, integer now and not returning anything. Okay. Uh, call to f1 actually invokes this here. Uh, the call to F2 and F3 are analogous. Uh, the last line proves that all three indices are mapped to the value 12. Okay. Uh, fair enough. Underscore can be skipped for trailing arguments. So the first argument could be bound. Uh, okay. So let's see here. Let's see what we've done uh, wrong here, though. Uh, if I call this int map, maybe I'm doing something just totally wrong here. Uh, but my impression was I could just uh, <clears throat> set this up as follows here. Um, let's see. So it was happy with most of this here. 
uh, until I try to assign the result here. And I could just call this. And it was doing something with our. Uh, now I guess I've never. Um, haven't bound this specific function here. So maybe maybe all this is just a distraction here. Let me. Uh, let's see. I'm going to Google this here. I think this is what I want here from this wiki page here. Functional parameter. Oh, okay, and they've actually got an add function. Brilliant here. Okay. Oh, I just just do uh, add dot bind here, and then I'll set one of the parameters, I guess, to one. And then I just call increment. Okay. And I guess I could have put a placeholder here. Okay. Way 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 simpler here. Sorry for that digression, but uh, good to figure out what we're doing. Okay, yeah, this map set stuff was some other uh, data structure. So I just do add uh, bind here, and then I'll make sure the first argument is the one. Let's see, that that should be it. Okay, brilliant. Uh, now I should be able to trace this, uh, and then I'll get three here finally. Okay. Let's scroll up a little bit. Yep, three. Okay, so that's cool. Uh, that's actually super simple. Ah, I love that. Uh, very clean uh, feature there. Okay, uh, and again, why might I want want to have a bunch of these bind functions? Again, if I'm imagining like in a game or something where I have some abstract factory or something, maybe you want to have a bunch of um, different bindings to set up creating specific types of you know objects or something of some type. Uh, so that could be a way to set things up, right? Making sure that you have a function call with three of the four parameters always in some way prepared and then you could just set up you know with one uh simpler function in a loop or something parsing some data you know and and, and uh, going through those fields there anyways it's kind of a functional thing to do here but um kind of a neat uh, feature here okay let's see we got optional arguments uh as well here uh okay oh we're still on the the binding page okay let's keep working through the language uh, we got to the pattern matching stuff, which we have seen properties. Um, okay. With custom read and write access. Okay. So your getters and setters are effectively, uh, taken care of here. Okay. I mean, so we've gotten through a good taste of the language. Um, and let's, let's do a quick look through the standard library. And I wonder what kind of support they have here. I mean, we've got, uh, some standard stuff, system libraries, um, lots of string up optimization stuff uh, op and operations on strings for string processing. Um, <laughs> must have had to write a lot of code to get this working, but nonetheless, uh, very cool. Um, okay, so reflection. Uh, oh, that's kind of cool here. Uh, and they've got the runtime type information here. Um, let's see. Oh, this is focusing on class and enum instances. Yeah, so anything at compile time, I imagine they can do some reflection on then. Um, and then we saw the runtime type information, as I mentioned, they've got serializer, timers, JSON, HTTP stuff. I mean, uh, a bunch of different data structures here. I mean, this is a pretty full uh, language and ecosystem. And then your specific libraries. Yeah. Okay. And this is going to be one of the things that I was curious about, because if we're targeting so many different platforms, um, making sure that we get the right behaviors with things like the, the thread API, for instance, is... You know, that's that's kind of interesting in itself. Um, so good to see that, because that was going to be one of my questions, because JavaScript is single threaded, right? So you don't get that support here. But if you're going to compile your project to C++ and target those platforms, looks like there is a uh, thread API here. Uh, looks pretty clean. Let's just go ahead and see some threads here. Uh, oh, it says it's deprecated. OK, <laughs> so maybe there's uh, systhread.thread. OK, so maybe they have something uh, cleaner here supported on more platforms or something. Um, ah, and it does tell you exactly where this is available. Okay, so that's not too bad. Um, looks like you get a message passing based system and so on. Um, so this is answering a lot of my questions. I mean, this this framework has to be well documented and it looks to be uh, for my first impression, right? You have to know what you're able to use. Um, oh, if you got a garbage collector here or something, um, which is kind of cool. Um, so, so that's a really good thing for this framework. I mean, you could tell a lot of time, many iterations have probably gone into this, um, documentation, the tools, the website's really clean, uh, community's active. There's active conferences every year. I mean, 
this is a great tool. I'm I'm really excited to um this one's been on my list for a while uh to take a look at and you know, it's got a lot of cool things here. Uh this library manager tool was very easy to get packages set up, right? We got C++ support in like seconds. Um so yeah, I'm kind of surprised more folks aren't using um hacks, but or maybe they are and I just don't know. Um it would be interesting to again maybe browse some more projects, uh, look at them at scale. You know, we got to look at some of the features here, but I mean, basically if you're comfortable with JavaScript, you can start using this tool um, or really any C-based language. Um, and it's got everything that you need. It's just a matter of, do you want lots of platform support, which seems to be the fundamental question here. Um, and if you, don't have to, especially if you don't have to write a lot of specific code for a specific platform, like if you don't need very specific iOS stuff or whatever, this might be the, the right framework for you. And it looks like, again, you'd probably use some of these other um, popular tools, whether it was like Lime or OpenFL, um, which was the Flash-based library here, I guess. Although maybe that's, let's make sure we get this correct here. It builds the native C++ or other uh, targets too. So, um, okay. And they're even trying to get it running on like PlayStation and stuff. So yeah, lots of really cool stuff here. Um, so with that, you know, we're at about an hour. I think I've got a feel for the language. I mean, uh, more the ecosystem that was really interesting and that we saw a lot of new things here. So anyways, folks, with that said, the language that has an X in it, because it has to, uh, <laughs> as mentioned here, um, and there's been some proven projects in it, which is really cool to see very active and i'm impressed with the ecosystem here so i enjoyed looking at this i've got my game developer conference shirt on it uh on today because i knew this was a game based or game focused language but it looks like it's being used in many different domains so yeah give this a uh you know check out the website download the tools it's very easy to install and overall i was excited to uh take a look at it and we saw some cool language features that we haven't dove into as much like the partial binding uh that i wrestled with for a few minutes there um but turned out to be uh, dead simple in the end <laughs> so anyways folks with that said i hope you enjoyed this lesson let me know in the comments below what things i missed about hacks what else you're looking forward to in this series and with that said folks thanks for your time and attention and i'll look forward to seeing you in the next video